Hi, everyone. We have made it to the end of another The Ed Collab gathering. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, before we move to our closing keynote, I would like to uh, just thank uh, a few important people who have helped make this day possible. Um, first of all, thank you to all of our presenters. Um, our presenters have given their time and their expertise to share with you um, all that they've been learning about this world that we're in right now, bringing forward their expertise from before to help you and all of our learning community to uh, really meet this moment. So thank you to all of you for giving your time, um, sharing your expertise and being a part of this incredible day. It wouldn't happen without all of you. And in just a few moments, I'll tell you how you could submit a proposal for our April spring gathering. So that's coming up in a moment. Um, so critical to today is our tech team. You can actually find a link to our tech team if you're up on the page. And I think it's about, uh, let me pull it up here. I'm going to find it specifically. Um, when you're on our gathering page, if you click in, yep, about, and then click on All Star Tech Team, there you can read all of these bios. Even more importantly, there are Twitter handle links to all of our tech team members. Please do reach out to them. Please give them a huge thank you. They are educators who are also volunteering their time well before today and on today um, to make sure that the presenters feel comfortable, that things are going well, that you have a great experience. So thank you to our tech team co-leaders who have been co-leaders of our gathering for a long time now. I can't believe this is our 14th. We're all too young for that. Um, but uh, thank you to Carolyn Hilarious and Jessica Walsh for um, your continued support of the work that we do for volunteering your time and for helping to lead uh, our tech team volunteers uh, yet again. So thank you, thank you. Um, our tech team mem members, Amy Kaiser, who's also the administrative assistant of the Ed Collab. Um, a special shout out to Amy who has done a lot of website magic and sending emails and connecting with folks and wrangling videos and, and doing a lot of the heavy lifting in these last couple of weeks up to today's gathering. So thank you, Amy. We couldn't do this without you. Um, Kristen Patrick, Lisa Brown, and Kanokla Taylor um, have once again uh, supported the work that we've been doing and supporting presenters as well. So again, um, please go to the page. You can read their bios and find ways that you can reach out and give them a shout out. Uh, if today was meaningful to you, if there were moments where you went, hey, whoa, or there's things that you tweeted or things that you wrote down, um, please do consider paying the joy forward. This day is free, um, no registration. It's our learning gift to the worldwide literacy community. Um, and uh, if anything reached you today and felt um, meaningful to you, please share that joy forward. Uh, you could give to First Book, which was adopted by our opening keynote, Sadia, or Books Through Bars and or Books Through Bars that was adopted by Tiffany and Julia, who will be our closing keynote in just a few moments here. Um, these organizations are just a few of many ways that you could pay the joy forward. You also don't have to do so monetarily. You can think about ways of paying this joy forward to even the people in your community or even people in your own house, um, just whatever you do, please take this joy, think what you might spend on a day like today and give that forward either in dollars to charities um, that need our support or through other actions. So please consider doing that. Um, as I said during my opening, uh, I dropped things off my to-do list like many of us are finding a way to do now. And thank you, Sadia, for the conversation we had before we went live. Sadia said, right now we have to give ourselves grace. And yes, yes. Um, so I did, as promised, uh, finally put up the pre-session. So the pre-session is where I talk about ways that you can continue to learn with the Ed Collab, not just in our gathering, but many other ways as well, including our study series, which this year will be 30 minute how to's. We're aiming for 24 different sessions, um, all 30 minutes on a wide range of topics to support you and the work that you're doing with your students or the work that you're doing with um, other adults in your community. Um, so information about that is coming soon. Please do sign up for our newsletter. You can find the link on our website 
to join our mailing list, or you can follow us on social media and we'll be sure to send out information then. Um, I also talk about Dana Stachowiak, um, uh, so graciously leading Reach Mindfulness for Educators, a series of mindfulness sits and social justice conversations that will take place um, the third Thursday of every month, starting in October. More information to come about those two, but thank you, Dana, as well as other ways that we can support you during this remote and hybrid time. Um, I uh, want to say a quick uh, hello and hi to folks from around the world who are joining us. Here are just a few. Hello to the US, Canada, the UK, Qatar, Mexico, Cambodia, Nigeria, Australia, the Dominican Republic. Hi to those of you that tuned in in China, Austria, Cameroon. Hello to Latvia, Belgium, Ireland, and the list goes on. Thank you so much for being a part of our uh, gathering today. It, it always feels inspiring and amazing to be able to reach each other in this way. Um, as I also said during the opening, um, the gathering uh, for quite a while, this has been kind of a novelty. It's It's been a unique thing to have an online literacy conference like this. There certainly have been other conferences that we've learned from, um, but we've been one of the few big ones that has um, brought a worldwide audience together. Now everyone's online. So now we get to see lots of ways that others are innovating um, ways of holding online conferences. But we're so glad to once again have our global community back here together, um, which also means it's time to announce our 15th, whew, our 15th The Ed Club gathering, which will be our spring 2021 gathering taking place in April. Drum roll, please. We are happy to announce that our spring gathering will take place on April 10th. And our opening keynote is illustrator and author, Mike Curado. Uh, Mike is author of the Little Elliot books, like Little Elliot in the Big City. Um, you may actually own the cute spotted little polka dot elephant um, that is from Mike's series of books. He is the illustrator of several award-winning books as well, like What If um, and Margaret Engel's book there. And he has a brand new YA graphic novel that just came out called Flamer. Um, he um, also will have some more books coming out this year, including one just a week, I think, uh, after our gathering. So we're very excited to welcome and to look forward to having Mike join us. Please feel free to tweet him at Mike Curato. Um, and Mike's not the only one who's presenting on April 10th at our gathering. We also would like you to present at April 10th on our gathering. Um, so for that to happen, you have to submit a proposal. All of the sessions that happen during the Ed Collab always involve um, members of our literacy community, literally from around the world. I will tell you, we have a soft spot for accepting proposals with students. There were two today. If you missed those, please go back and take a look. Um, but we uh, hope that you will consider submitting your proposal. If you're wondering if you should, yes. If you're wondering, will anyone care? Yes. If you're wondering, do I have anything worth sharing? Of course you do. Um, you can find more information on the website. If you go up to that main bar, it says proposals. Oh, just click on that and you'll find it. We also will be tweeting out the direct link uh, shortly. So um, please consider joining Mike Curato and the rest of us on April 10th. We hope you'll submit a proposal. and We'd love to see you then. So in our slightly live, slightly recorded um, uh, conference today. Um, what is going to happen is I'm going to introduce our uh, closing keynote. And then if you are watching live, this session with me will end. And on the page, the same page that you're on right now, if you refresh, you'll see Tiffany and Julia, and they are scheduled to start at 3.15. So that's where you'll see their session. Um, if you are watching this as a recording, We've hopefully already edited it together and you don't have to go anywhere else. But if you're watching live, and I'll remind you of this again, in just a few moments, you'll hit refresh and you'll see their session just below this video. Um, but I would like to introduce them. So we are so honored and excited to have Tiffany D. Jackson and Julia E. Torres um, uh, host our closing keynote for today's truly incredible gathering. This day was just so inspiring and full of so much energy and what a perfect way to end it. Um, Tiffany D. Jackson, as you, I, neither of these two women really need an introduction, but here it is anyway. Tiffany D. Jackson is a number of, uh, is the author of a number of award-winning books, um, including her newest, Grown, which if you've been following on social media at all, if you were lucky enough to pre-order Grown, it also came with some really cool hoop earrings as the pre-order gift. So 
very nice touch to Tiffany and to um, any everyone involved in making those earrings happen. That was very cool. Um, Tiffany is author of Let Me Hear a Rhyme, allegedly the award-winning Monday's Not Coming, as well as other texts. Um, if you'd like to find out other places that Tiffany's talking, she right now is on a virtual book tour for Grown, so you still have a few more dates you might be able to catch her. You can go to her website, writeinbk.com, or you can follow her on social media at right in BK, and we hope that you will, although you likely already are, so I don't know why I'm telling you that, but just in case, you can find Tiffany there. Um, and then Julia Torres is a teacher librarian in Denver. Um, she is a member of the Educator Collaborative, is also a founding member of Disrupt Text, and someone who also needs no introduction. And she um, was gracious enough to help lead this conversation with Tiffany D on Black Girlhood. So before I send you off to refresh your page and watch them, just one final reminder, if anything brings you joy today, including this closing session, please, please pay the joy forward. There's no registration for today ever. Our hope is that you think about what you might spend on a cup of coffee or what you might spend on a meal, or even if, if you're able, what you might spend on a registration for a day like this and instead find a place to pay it forward. I saw online today people already sharing these two um, organizations that they were sending donations to. We would love it if before you finish watching today, you tweet out using the hashtag the Ed Club gathering somewhere that you've donated it to, or if it's not monetary, a way that you're going to pay the joy forward as well. So thank you to everyone for making this day so special. And thanks to all of you for joining in. We hope to see you on April 10th as Mike Carrado is our opening keynote and hopefully you will be a part of our gathering as well. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, welcome everybody to the final session of the Ed Collab Fall Gathering. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here with me, I'm Julia Torres, and here with me is author extraordinaire and my friend, Tiffany D. Jackson, the author of Allegedly, Monday's Not Coming, Let Me Hear a Rhyme, and Grown. So welcome. We are so happy to have you here today with us. Um, I know that you've gone through a long day of professional development. Hopefully you've been inspired by some folks and you've learned some new things and gotten to make community online. Um, Tiffany and I both believe that citations are political. So please make sure if you hear things from either of us that inspire you or that you like, please cite us. Um, you can use the hashtag, the Ed Collab Fall Gathering, and you can use Tiffany's at or my at if you like the things that we say. So I wanna turn it over to Tiffany to talk to you a little bit and introduce herself. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. We're good? So. Okay. All right. Well, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I figured I'd show you a little briefing about some of my books, and then, you know, we could just get into questions. I like, you know, just basically having a conversation anyway. Um, I we really wish we could be with you, like, in person. Um, but, you know, obviously, extreme times calls for extreme measures, and I hope everyone is being safe and uh, staying healthy as well, too. I am going to share with you a little bit about my journey. See if I can get this to work. Okay. So, um, so about me, a little bit about me, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I actually went to Hendrick Hudson High School, which is a high school out in the suburbs of New York, um, but left there, went to Howard University, which is a historically black college uh, down in Washington, DC. I studied film and television there. And I've been working in film and television for the past 15 years in various different companies before I became a full-time writer. And uh, most of my books are under Catherine Teagan Books, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. Uh, my first book that came out uh, in 2017 is called Allegedly. It is loosely inspired, on, just to give you a briefing about what the book is about, is about a girl who was convicted of murder at three, at nine years old. And now she's 16 and she's pregnant. And the only way to keep her baby is to convince everyone she didn't commit the first murder. But the only way to do that is through her mother, who she has a very, very contentious relationship with. This book is loosely inspired by a real case that happened in Maine back in 2012 of a nine-year-old girl who was convicted of murdering a three-month-old baby. And she was the youngest person in the state of Maine and one of the youngest in the country to actually be convicted of murder. 
It took me about a week to draft it, which is really highly unusual, but also took three years to complete it. I did a lot of research in the book, uh, for the book, actually. I spoke to lawyers, doctors, psychologists, social workers, um, correctional officers at various different prisons. And I basically took all of their stories, including stories of girls who have been through the juvenile justice system and through group homes, and took all their stories and compiled them into a book that you see in front of you today. It also includes interview transcripts and mixed media. So it's a sort of a book that sort of um, is more of a living, breathing experience. You're sort of a part of the investigation. So that's my first baby. That one is such a big deal at school. It's awesome to use it as a book club book too, because I think it really grabs students who are more selective readers because it just kicks from the beginning. People are interested and they want to know what's going to happen, yeah. what did happen. So I love, yeah. I love the way that book is structured. And of course, that's the book that people like argue about the most uh, yeah. <laughs> when they get down to it. So yes, I do feel like it's a really good intro book for uh, especially for kids who are just looking for something interesting to read as well too. Yeah. Um, my second book uh, which came out in 2018 is called Monday's Not Coming and it's about a girl named Claudia whose best friend Monday is missing and no one seems to notice until she shows up one year later. Um, this also is loosely inspired by two real cases, one that happened in uh, Detroit, Michigan, another one that happened in Southeast Washington DC uh, where the story actually takes place. Uh, I turned in this book a week before the hashtag missing DC girls went viral and that hashtag had to do with the fact that uh, around this time around um, the beginning in 2017 uh, the DC Police Department posted a bunch of photos of missing black girls almost 50 of them ages range from 14 to 17 who were all missing within you know a short period of time and so everyone was like well why are you just posting this now like this is crazy this amount of girls to be missing at, at one point in time and so it got me to thinking about the idea of missing black children and why they aren't a national priority and why aren't they being looked for and cared for like we see with other girls particularly like white girls who have the resources and funding to actually look for those children and they seem to be more cared for because they're delicate um, versus black girls you know they can handle the quote unquote pain. Um, this book also includes DC subculture, so IE includes food, it includes some slang, it also includes music called Go Go, um, which I was really excited to bring uh, to the story specifically because um, I did spend some time in DC um, and I was there when one of the cases actually happened um, right after I graduated from Howard University. And I really wanted to see uh, the DC uh, subculture come alive on the page. So I spent a lot of time in DC trying to get the story exactly right and getting it, you know, thoroughly vetted by a DC native and go go person, uh, Jason Reynolds. Uh, I would not be able to publish this and he, unless he gave me his blessing, which he did. So that was fine. That's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> That's a relief for me, yes, because, you know, he would just troll me regardless. Uh, <laughs> I have heard he does um, things. That, that book was one of the first that I read actually. And I read that one before allegedly. And I can tell you right now that when I met you in person, I think that that book had just come out. Cause I remember I, I bought the, um, the hardback copy. And yeah. one of the reasons that I love the book so much is because it centers that relationship between two girls, that best friend closeness that a lot yeah. of books just don't capture or gloss over. Like they have a miscellaneous best right. friend, but in this one you get into the nitty gritty of like what it means to be part of a close female friendship. And I love that. Right, because a lot of, you know, missing children's stories that I've seen always focus, and you know, rightfully so, on the parent's reaction of the person being missing or the grandparent. But there's so many ancillary people in our lives. Like how does, you know, a child going missing affects their best friends, their classmates, their teachers, their postal service, um, postal man. Like how does it affect everyone? But um, particularly with best friend relationships, and you know, I always make this comparison uh, when I talk to people um, or I talk at school visits, I always tell kids that your best friend is honestly, you know, the first real like love of your life. 
like that's the person who knows where the bodies are buried you know they know you inside and out your mother father you know significant other will never know you as closely as your best friend and to lose your best friend that is like almost like losing one of your own appendages and so what would that feel like and so i wanted to you know really incorporate that a friendship uh, a strong solid friendship within a book uh so that was sort of my um mainstay in the midst of all of everything else that was going on in the book that was the main point of the book is like a friendship story well you did that successfully and i believe there was an award associated with this one can you tell us about <laughs> that um i did get uh the uh Carrez Scott king john steptoe new talent award uh for this book which was a complete and total shock for me um i also it was also a walter d myers um honor book as well too through we need diverse books uh so it you know it got a couple things you know. it deserved them you deserve them <laughs> phenomenal and i don't want to go off because i'm biased but this is one that i love this book is very near and dear to my heart and i'm not even from dc so i love it and i know folks from dc will love it and then even if you're not from dc but you're curious about the place and then of course about the topic i think that this is just a phenomenal piece of art so thank you thank you yeah so um, my next book, this book came out actually last year, 2019, it's called Let Me Hear Rhyme. It's set in Brooklyn in 1998, and so it's considered historical fiction uh, to make everyone feel old in the room. Uh, and it's a year after Biggie Smalls dies, it's about two teen boys and uh, their sister who turned their murdered best friend into a rap superstar by pretending he's still alive. Um, I sort of uh, pitched this as notorious meets Weekend at Bernie's. If you've ever watched either of those two movies, you would sort of understand, you know, the juxt there. Um, basically, this is actually a book that's very near and dear to my heart, especially since, you know, I am a child of hip hop. I'm also a Brooklyn kid. Uh, the three main characters basically make up my entire, like, actual personality. <laughs> as far as just being that type of, like, person, um, very smart mouth, but very, you know, conscious and very, you know, hustle spirit as well, too. Um, so yeah, this is, this really incorporates my two love of Brooklyn and of hip hop. And I wanted to write a book that really sort of talks about this particular period of time, 1998, which was a pivotal year in hip hop history. It was right after uh, Biggie and Tupac died. And it was really a question of where does hip hop go after this? Does it go back to the, you know, to the underground or does rise to the occasion and goes into mainstream? And that's exactly what it did. Uh, so we sometimes call 1998 the Phoenix years because everything sort of burned to the ashes and the Phoenix rises from the ashes. Um, and everything that you see in hip hop today literally started with this year. Um, so I want, and because I feel so strongly about hip hop history, and kids knowing, you know, the culture that they participate in, especially since there are so many kids who are a part of hip hop culture, whether they realize it or not, I strongly believe that, you know, books like this should be taught in like, you know, English classes and, you know, US history classes, because this is a huge part of our US history, of our Black history. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And the female character in this one, since the title of our little presentation here is about Black girlhood, um, the, <laughs> the female protagonist in this one is so interesting to me because she, I don't want to ruin the book for folks, so I won't tell them too much about her journey, but yeah. she does have like a solo journey that she goes on where, excuse me, my cat is going to be making an appearance momentarily. So if you see her tail, excuse me, but anyway, um, she it's so interesting because she does have a solo journey of becoming stronger in herself, of coming into her own voice. So that piece is there, but then she also, she's not like a side character to the male protagonist. They very much share equal space in the narrative. Yeah, they, there's literally three protagonists in this book. So three different voices that you hear within the book. And what we love most about, or what I love most about Jasmine is the fact that she does become like, she starts off, slightly closed-minded, um, but then she starts to bloom. And that's a, you know, a huge part of developing you know, your own personality is blooming as you learn and as you unlearn things and reprogram and you know, everything in between. So I do feel like she has such a fantastic like, feminist vibe to her that actually was sprinkled out throughout all the other like, um, 
women characters in the book, all the girl, other girls, and, you know, she really, like, brought that out of them as well, too, so I think that, you know, she definitely is um, probably my second favorite character. I got a lot of love for her, absolutely. (laughs) Amazing, she's amazing, I love that book, and there is a teaching guide, Um, there are teaching guides for all of these, right? Yeah, yeah, there are teaching guides for all of these books, um, and uh, Julia actually helped craft the teaching guide for this book particularly. And um, we really wanted to focus on the idea of using, um, well, I guess uh, for lack of a better word, slang and like colloquialism, you know, within the hip hop, you know, community and how you can apply that in terms of like, you know, kids and their writing. Um, And, you know, I've seen a lot of people use this book or the teaching guide uh, in different ways. A lot of people have uh, paired this book with um, some Shakespeare, uh, which I thought that was actually kind of cool. That's very um, especially since, Yeah, especially since this book actually features rhymes uh, written by my best friend, uh, Malik, Malik the, the Sharif, um, who's on the cover of the book as well, too. Noted on the cover of the book. And There's all of his... Instagram uh, material by you two, right? Isn't there on your Instagram feed? Is there like... I think I remember when the book came out, you had some stuff, some videos on IG. Yes, Maybe? yes. Okay. Yeah, there, there's some, there's some videos, and there's actually a music video that was a lyric music video that was done for the main song that Malik uh, wrote for the book, um, and it's also on uh, YouTube as well too, um, and it's also featured on my website, so you can just find it there as well too. Oh, kitty. Yeah, <laughs> she likes to be seen. That's Maisie. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and the the Monday's Not Coming guide was um, written by a couple educators out of DC right? Mm -hmm. Um, Mary Mm -hmm. Thomas, I think, and Ashley. Ashley, Ashley Rose. Ashley Rose and Mary Thomas. So that one has a guide as well. Can we, can they get that on your website? Um, not currently, um, but all of the webs, um, I mean, all of the student guides are actually through Harper Sachs as well too. So if you want to contact the publisher as well, they can definitely, um, and they've been posting them a lot lately. So you probably sort of like, flash by them on Twitter or something like that. Um, But I'm hoping to upload, I just redid my site. So I'm hoping to upload those guys so they'll be a bit more readily available um, through my website as well. Love it. I'm all about people teaching with these books because I think they resonate, I know they resonate with students and I'm all about students being able to learn with the books that they love. So yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, And my last but not least book uh, is called Grown, which is out, um, well, by this recording, it's already out. (laughs) And um, this is about uh, a girl named Enchanted, a 17-year-old aspiring singer who is swooned by a legendary yet older R&B superstar with promises of fame that leads her to turn against her family and friends until his body shows up and all fingers point to her. Now she must find the voice to bring justice and uh, also uh, bring her abuse to light as well too. Uh, So this book is also loosely inspired by a real case. Um, We don't even need to get into the real case. It's actually more or less inspired by the reaction to that real case and talking about the ideas and the concept of girls being grown and the idea of who is actually at fault in these type of situations. And so I always point to the adults in the room and say, well, if there is at least one adult in the room, that adult knows better. And so therefore this is what this book is actually sort of talking about. Um, This book does not have an educator's guide as of yet. Um, uh, Corona sort of plays a part into a lot of, uh, you know, our delays with this as well too. Right? Yep, yep. Um, but I will say that this book also does have resources, has resources at the back of the book. There's also an author's note, uh, that speaks to my experience because I also had an age inappropriate relationship at a young age. Uh, my first, uh, boyfriend was 22 and I was 15. And so I talk a little bit about my experiences and what I brought in terms of emotionally, uh, to writing this book. But there's also resources in the back of the book that uh, for anyone who feels they are in a dangerous situation, um, this book also opens with a content warning. Uh, so, you know, for anyone who fears any triggers, anything like that, it really lists it out completely um, in the very, for, like, basically the very first page before you even open part one. Um, so I am very proud it. of that story. I couldn't put it down. I mean, you saw me. I was over there on my tablet 
turning pages, you know, it's very much one of those that like, as soon as you open it, you can't put it down and you're riveted. What I like about Monday is that each of the chapters ends and it makes you want to continue. For this one, I think almost at the end of every page, you just have to know what goes on on the next page. So mm. I wouldn't say that's not true of Monday, but I feel like it's just structured a little bit differently in that way. Um, and I love, you have to show them your earrings. I love oh, the uh, order. Yeah, this yeah. is the pre-order campaign. It says grown, which is just like the, uh, I, I wear these now like everywhere, um, but just also like kind of like my standard practice. And you know, I already had bamboo earrings like before I even got these. Uh, so, you know, this is basically my uniform. Uh, that <laughs> makes sense. I love it. Yes. I'm waiting on mine yes. to here. Yes. So um, those are I mean, one other thing I can say about Drawn is that it is a tough read, but it's a very fast read, and it's a very um, necessary read in a lot of ways, especially for girls who could potentially find themselves in this particular circumstance. Um, but I'm sure we're going to, like, get into more of this. So let me stop screen sharing. <laughs> you will get into more of it, yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I can tell you that though there are similarities as a reader between your books i do find them each to be distinctly different in tone and then my emotional reaction to them i think for allegedly it was like it was like oh yeah oh yeah okay oh yeah and then there's like you know surprises that you it just like takes you by surprise you know at certain points and i think monday does that too monday is more for me like i fell in love with the two protagonists because I have female friendships like that, where mm -hmm. I just saw that depicted on the page. And so it was a more gradual emotional experience for me. And then Let Me Hear a Rhyme has that, those ups and downs, a lot of the ups and downs, just like songs do. So I love yeah. that, you know, and then Grown for me was like shock after shock where, but not in a bad way, Tiffany. It was like, yeah. you should be shocked by what's going on. And then if you have ever been in those shoes or if you've ever had an age inappropriate relationship, which a lot of us have, unfortunately, especially a lot of black girls, because we are, as your Cosmo article says, we are forced to grow up a little bit too soon, a lot of times, um, yeah. or treated like we're older than we are. So yeah. um, though they have similarities, they're each unique. And I, I just love the way that different parts of you have come out in each of them and how you connect to each one of us in a different way with each book. So mm. what do you think so far the response has been to Grown? Um, I have, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I, I've actually heard a lot of positive feedback about this book, um, which I was not expecting. I honestly thought I was going to be dragged. I thought that this book was gonna be like, I thought I was going to get everything wrong. So, you know, before, you know. I would have told you. I would have said something. I, I no, and that's why I had you read it. I had, like, every Black woman I know read this book to be like, and ha like, anything. Anything is wrong. Just let me know. And I will change it immediately. Like, we didn't even really, I, I, I don't think we went to print until June. And even up until then, I was like, are you sure you didn't see anything wrong with this book? Um, so far, yeah, the only kind of like the few reviews I've seen that are, have been, their negative comments has noted that the main character, Enchanted, um, was slightly naive. And I was like, well, see, you just sort of played right into what I was talking about. The idea that this Black girl can't be naive, mm -hmm. that she's supposed to be all knowing and all wise at this age. Like you sort of play into the stereotypes that black girls are supposed to be more adult like than everything than what you imagine them to be. Mm -hmm. So those kind of reviews, I was like, huh, oh, yeah, you should probably check your own internal biases and what you think black girls should be like. Well, maybe. and even that notion of holding on to naivete or being naive is a bad thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. maybe re remaining. I mean, though we have to protect ourselves early, I think that that state of innocence is taken away from a lot of us really early. Like you yeah. said, you know, we're not allowed to remain in that space of naivete for too long because, yeah. you know, when you're a small child, you might learn about, you know, somebody's um, uncle who has inappropriate behaviors or mannerisms toward them 
or yeah. you might, you know, go to summer camp and have a traumatizing experience. So it, I really respect the fact that you were bold enough to talk about it, but also sensitive enough to recognize that it could be triggering to folks and that it would right. bring up those emotions, but that it's healthy yeah. to talk about the emotions and what it brings up for folks, you know? And that's, and that's something that like, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot in terms of like, you know, you know, black literature in the YA space is like, you know, the idea of like all these black pain books. And I always have to, you know, declassify myself from that because I'm like, I write in, th in the thriller genre. So there has to be some type, like there has to be some type of mystery. Like, right. I was like, I, like you, you can't put me into that sort of group without like recognizing the fact that I'm in actually in the genre. Um, and to be quite honest, there's only three black authors in the YA space in the thriller genre. So yeah, we are a very small margin. But when I think, when I also consider that, I also need to remind people that if we don't actually start talking about and really bringing up some of the bad things that are happening, they sort of become like they're easily forgettable quite frankly and so I always like to remind people like you know hey like we can find a way to subtly talk about something um our own internal biases and also make it something that is I hate to say the word entertaining but unforgettable for kids because remember we're we're writing these books for kids so that they can actually be better adults than we are Right. And as we read them, like in class, we're creating that learning experience and that environment. And in class, we're going to have male, female, non-gender conforming, um, LGBTQ, cis, heterosexual. We're going to have all of these students, um, cisgendered and heterosexual students in our classes. So when we bring these books into school as librarians or as language arts educators, what are some things that you would hope folks would bring up. Of course, there's the, you know, the hypersexualization of Black girls. But as we look at all of your books as a whole, what are some things that you hope would be teachable moments for, for folks? I think the biggest teachable moment is the idea of the adultification of Black girls. The idea that, you know, Black girls are so self-sufficient on their own that they don't need, you know, someone to watch out for them. Um, that they, supposedly know better than other students that are surrounding them and so therefore they don't uh, deserve you know the same level of protection and level of care and I think that that's something that sort of is a theme that happens literally from allegedly to Monday's not coming somewhat in let me hear rhyme and also in uh and definitely in grown is the idea that you know there's this misconception that you know a that, girl, that black girls know what they're doing and that we don't really need to worry about them the way we need to worry about other students who aren't exposed to the world like black girls are and I'm like well no you still should be looking for the black girl even though you think that she's missing because she quote unquote ran away with her boyfriend which is a lot of the reason why police officers don't look for black girls because they think they're being grown and grown and going to go look for their boyfriends when a lot of the time they actually were kidnapped yeah. um yeah I think I, I think that's where I, I I get frustrated the most is the idea that you know these girls don't have the right to be cared for yeah and so my hope is that when you have these kind of conversations in classrooms is to remind there's you know each, your students and to have students remind each other that hey like you know these are our peers, these are, these are our classmates, these are our sisters. Like, we should be caring for them as much as they care for us as well, too. And that, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been in classrooms where, like, a boy will actually raise his hand and say, like, oh, well, she probably was doing something, something. I'm like, well, where did you get that idea from? Mm -hmm. And typically, nine times out of ten, it's their parents or older brother, you know, siphoning, I mean, um, injecting that type of information into mm -hmm. their psyche and yeah. so that's why a lot of times it's about unpacking and really exposing and giving kids the full scope of the story which is what we're doing in grown is giving kids a full scope of how a girl can be brainwashed how can a girl wind up in this type of situation 
Mm -hmm. um, even if that girl is from a two parent household who wants for nothing. Like, mm -hmm. how does something like that actually happen? Because a lot of the kids just think that it's something that, you know, oh, well, she was just being dumb. Mm -hmm. No, that's not the case at all. And so one of the reasons why these types of stories, why I want to write these types of stories is I really want to lay out the foundation of exactly how something like this can happen, rather than you just sort of hearing it from one of the adults maybe that's surrounding you. And a lot of times folks don't hear about it, right? I appreciate that each of these books sheds a light on something that for whatever reason, if it does make national news, it's just a blip. Whereas people will spend mm -hmm. weeks or months or years talking yeah. about Elizabeth Smart, for example. And then they'll have a yeah. People magazine that comes out on the five year anniversary of Elizabeth Smart getting found, you know, but nobody's really talking about us. Right. Very long at there all. Was, there was a recently, um, there was an article about how there were 39 girls found in a you know a shipping crate in georgia 39 black girls alive alive mm. and they were all just uh, recently kidnapped through the sexual i mean um, human trafficking um system and to me i'm like that should have been bigger news that you found all these children alive in right. a damn shipping crate Right. In Georgia. I was like, why is this not like this should be why, on every news? Not channel. a headline. Right. Yeah. Why is this not on the cover of People magazine as we just discussed? Like, why aren't these things important? And the way that we're asking these questions, we need to have kids asking these questions too. Yeah. Like, just be and this is what I tell kids all the time, just because you can't vote that doesn't mean that you don't have a voice. Right that you could still like, you know, march up into anyone's, um, you know, town hall board meeting and demand to know like, why aren't these things happening? They have to answer you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and not only that, but I think it does start in our school communities. We know that Monique Morris wrote that book, Push Out. And she mm -hmm. talks about how black girls get pushed out of our school system. We get erased. And then as adults, if you're a, you know, a black educator, then a lot of times folks just will either co-opt your ideas or they'll just erase you completely and not listen to your voice. But yet, mm -hmm. how can I be the angry, loud black woman and still the person who gets ignored and erased and silenced and has my ideas co-opted at the same time? Like, how does that right. work? You know, like how could, <laughs> that's right. exactly, and that exactly is a part of the whole idea of identification of black girls yeah. is the idea that, you know, Hey, we are speaking, we are being brave and we're speaking and we're telling you that this is unjust. And then you call us adults and then say that we should know better. And we're like, no, we're just actually trying to tell you that this is a problem, that something is wrong. Yeah. And so it's, it's almost like a double-edged sword sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it starts the change for that really starts within our own sort of programming, internal programming of how we see girls mm -hmm. and particularly how we see black girls. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I guess I keep starting with kids. Cause I'm like, you know, <laughs> some adults are, are, you know, we're old. Yeah. And it's hard, it's hard to change exactly our thinking. And I, I even I am guilty. I'm definitely not perfect. And I'm still sort of trying to, unlearn things that you know have been taught to me and you know i and i talked about this actually um recently in that cosmo article about saying how some of the programming that's in my mind was you know passed down generations the idea of being grown or you know not wearing a short skirts or whatever the case is don't you know draw too much attention to yourself that was all passed down as not because you know our mothers and grandmothers inherently thought that young girls were like, you know, evil, treacherous, you know, Jezebels or anything like that. But no, it was more passed down as a form of protection yeah. because they were aware that, you know, we rarely got justice. So they were really truly trying to spare us a lot of the grief and pain that they have seen since basically the beginnings of you know, our enslavement. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know, we also need to sort of like step back and have some compassion for some of the women that have been trying to protect us in the, unfortunately, in the only way that they know how mm -hmm. is to, through fear tactics. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I also have to give myself grace as well too, but I'm hoping that, you know, let's start with a different generation. Let's not teach the ideas of being grown to, you know, young kids and, you know, having them, call each other that mm -hmm. as well too 
Well, and it's interesting too, right? Because they'll often say, oh, you just think you've grown. So there's that, you know, you're acting too big. And then there'll yeah. be like the conversations about, okay, I'm going to need you to grow up. And I need you to dress like this and act like this and be professional. That's language you hear a lot in schools directed towards students. I need you to, you know, be prepared for the future world. And we do have a tendency to talk to our students as though they should know better all the time when a lot of, of the time they are kids and they're trying to navigate the world and they're trusting that we're going to have yeah. their best interests at heart, not necessarily the adult agenda, which is why yeah. I love so many of the books that are coming out now because it's very clear there's no like adult agenda here necessarily. There's just a desire to tell a good story in a way that perhaps will teach kids something, but then also will be enjoyable for them, you know? Oh, yeah. No. You froze for a minute. I, I, think, I think that was always like, that was something definitely missing. Oh, you see me? You're good now. Yeah. Okay. I think that was something that really, you know, played a part in my childhood in terms of like, you know, how I absorb books. Um, because if they weren't enjoyable or they weren't at the least very much, you know, something giving me that, that same thrilling feeling that I had just living like in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. <laughs> You know, We've talked about rush. the subway many times. Like that sense of rush and urgency and just, you know, that, 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 the, the, the feeling of survival, yeah. like just, I need that. I need, those are, you know, emotions that I can understand. And I never really got that when I was younger. Like a lot of books that, you know, it just seemed like they were in suburban environments or they were in country settings. And I'm like, I know nothing about any of that. So I need books that actually speak to my, my emotional language. Um, and also something that I won't just like read and forget. Like there's so many books that I like completely went in one ear and out the other. I can't tell you the person's name from the book or anything like that. But if you give me a thrilling story, I will remember every moment of it. Well, they say that you're supposed to write the books that you want to read. And that's what we tell our young people to do. So yeah. I have some questions for some young people. Okay. Um, so is it okay if I just hit you yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. Random order? Yeah. Okay. So one of the questions is, um, when you're not writing amazing books, what do you like to do in your free time? <sighs> so before Corona. <laughs> so. Um, BC. BC. Um, <laughs> I used to enjoy um, traveling a lot. I used to travel all the time. Um, I also used to like kicking it with my friends. I used to love going to parties and dance and sweat it out. And, you know, sometimes um, dancing is very much like your therapy. And I very much miss uh, my therapist in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I, I used to enjoy being outdoors and living my life and having a life, quite frankly. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. <laughs> I love those things too. And I, the most that I get these days is getting out here with my dog most of the time. But sometimes I go up into the mountains and, you know, we enjoy what we can where we are, but I hope we get to travel again soon. I miss yeah, it. yeah. Who or what are you most inspired by? So talking about maybe like mm. people or books or places, cultures, anything that you're most inspired by? I am inspired by the regular girl. Mm -hmm. Like I, and I, and I have this debate all the time. I feel like the, the regular girl, like the regular girl who's like, you know, round the way girl from the block or whatever, who doesn't feel like her story is, good enough to be told mm -hmm. um and that person inspires me because everyone's story everyone has a story to be told mm -hmm. um and I think when I think about those girls and I think about like regular girls well, like even me I'm I very much consider myself a regular regular girl but I also I've had moments where you know I feel like my story needed to be told um so those girls are the ones who the quiet ones you know, the ones who are holding in so much um, for so many people, I feel like those are the people who, uh, those are the girls who inspire me the most. Those are the, the girls that are woven throughout your characters. Can we read yeah. about them a little bit? Yes, they're the ones. So I, I, I think 
knowing that there's so many other girls out there whose stories deserve to get told, I feel like I have a long life ahead of me of just writing stories that really just speaks to their experience. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to read them. I do enjoy them. Um, So that's a good, that's good news for us to hear. What is a book that you've read that you didn't think that you would like, but you did? New or old? Somebody you know, somebody you don't. Doesn't matter. Actually, I was just talking about this with my mom. Um, So, which is funny because now I I talk about her all the time. Like, oh, you know, my literary grandmother and stuff like that. But I really thought that I was going to hate Toni Morrison's Blue's Eye. I, oh. I I really thought I was going to hate it because I was like, oh, this is such an old book. And it was one of those books that my, my mom, you know, of course, like summer reading, your parents like make you like read like a stack of books by the end of the summer. And it was in one of those stacks. And I was like, oh, no, I don't want to read about this, blah, blah, blah. And then ended up um, loving it mm-hmm. and being so drawn to it, especially since, you know, I went to a predominantly white high school. And there were no books of color on, you know, any of my syllabuses or or even barely in the library. There were no Toni Morrison books in the library um, of my high school. So to be introduced, you know, in such a way where I was, you know, somewhat forced to read, but also enjoyed it. Uh, And now I talk about her all the time, like, you know, my bestie. I was completely wrong, but yeah. (laughs) That's really good to hear because that book is on a lot of um, curriculum lists still. So yeah. that's one that a lot of folks teach and they come back around to it. I taught it to, I think they were 11th graders or maybe it was 12th grade. It was 11th or 12th grade, but they were, they were always really shocked, of course, but the structure is so creative and I love that. I think that actually is a part of it is that I was never in love with traditional like structured books where it's a story that literally just was told from A to Z. I liked stories that like, you know, flipped back in time and uh, broken up into like interviews and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I I wanted to feel like I was like in the midst of the story, that it was a production that I was a part of. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know why that that book hooked me in so quickly. Yeah. 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 And I do see that that tendency in your books as well to move around in time and to kind of, I think rhyme starts with with a year right or at some yeah. Point, yeah it tells you like the setting right away just like a movie it's gonna drop you in the setting in Brooklyn you can smell it you can hear it you can see it you know I like that I like that yeah. about it too. <laughs> so um do you have oh what do you enjoy most about being an author oh, that's a question damn um I think I enjoy most um, the developing of a story like when as soon as I get an idea and all of a sudden I'm like this may actually work and I start like drawing out the outline and then researching and realizing like and then maybe coming up with the ending that I may change eventually and it turn into a plot twist um, which all my books have um, that rush of excitement like oh my god this may work um, that's actually my favorite part about being a writer um, I don't, I mean, I don't know so much about like the actual like writing part, <laughs> uh, cause it could be a little exhausting, especially, you know, being a full-time writer, you are basically working for yourself. You are the administrative assistant, the accountant, the, um, the marketing guru, graphic designer. Um, now I'm my own videographer and photographer. Like I am all the things. Um, so I rarely like 10% of my time is actually writing and I clutch on to that time, um, which is probably why I miss traveling so much is because I was able to write undisturbed. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I'm, I'm not. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you're making such good content for us. I saw a video the other day with you and Ashley and Nick and Danielle. I think that's everybody who was in it. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. Promoting grown, and that was really great because it it had that personal feel, but it also high production value. So congrats on that. It looked Thank really you. good. It looked. It was, Thank you. It was great. Yeah. Those are really important for our students to see. So, um, last question: okay. Is there? We're already kind of nearing that time. Is there anything that you can tell us as far as clues or any 
information you can reveal about your next project. I know Grown was just born into the world. So we are still talking about Grown, but what can we look for from you in the future? Um, so these books were announced, so it's not even uh, super uh, secret information. Okay. Um, but my next book is called um, Smoke, uh, which is a set in a dilapidated city um, in the Midwest. Um, surround, and it's about a, mix, a newly mixed family um, who moved into a renovated home that's surrounded by dilapidated houses and uh the young woman thinks that the house is haunted but it may be something far worse uh so it's sort of a um mashup of the haunting of hill house meets get out Ooh. and uh so it's technically my first um psychological horror okay um so it's sort of like a psychological thriller i guess it's, it's very much still in the same vein um and then my book after after that is actually a Carrie retelling set at a school's first interracial prom. Um, and that book, uh, I'm, not, I'm actually really excited to like finish writing <laughs> yeah. whenever I get to that. Um, so yeah, my next two books are sort of in the horror genre, and um, which I'm really proud of because um, one, I've, I've been watching horror movies since I was four, like that is my jam um, from the get go. And two, there's once again, there's not a lot of black women in that space and so this is gonna be another one of those things where I'm like I am by myself I be my friend um but I think it's necessary because there are so many girls who were like me who were always reading horror novels in like high school and didn't see enough of me on the page um so I'm excited to give students that I my child is going to be in the background shortly. Okay, I'm being, I'm recorded. Bye. I love you. This is recorded. I'll see you later. Okay, love you. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I think is so important for our educational community to remember is that right now, Black female educators are absolutely in the minority. And as mm -hmm. you've mentioned quite a few times, Black female authors um, of also, children's lit are also, are also in the in minority. The yeah. So in order for us to have more, we're going to have to change some things. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> our parting message, what can you tell folks that, you know, you'd love to see 10 years from now? Um, I feel like we're doing it. I feel like the work that we are doing in, in these, you know, pivotal years are really inspiring kids. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into school visits or in detention centers um, in prisons and actually I've said to a kid like, wow, you're a writer. Like, and I think it's just a physical, like literally physically being seen. Um, whether it's physically seen or even you know on the interwebs like it's really changing the dynamics and making kids like sort of open up and be like oh like i can do this um which is something that i didn't have as a kid i didn't have like a writer that looked like me walk at hell i never met a writer until i became one so i think that it's about just like keep doing what we're doing on top of um, on top of actually like also being uplifted by our, you know, other sisters and brothers who can see that we are, you know, of the minority. Um, I really appreciate everyone who has taken a moment to uplift me as well, too. And so I think, yeah, it, I, that would be my first thing. Um, but I'm sure there's so much more to do. Right I would agree. I would agree. And I, you have very much, you know, uplifted and supported me pretty continuously um in my library so i'm very grateful to you for that and yeah. super excited that you know the world is going to get to know about your books and about you through this presentation that we were able to put together so thank you for making time during this awesome amazing release week um to oh speak to the ed collab folks so excited. yes i really appreciate you guys like having me here and you know yes yeah, like like i said to julia all the time i mean like if i had a teacher with a dope head wrap like, you know, or a librarian, I'm sorry, a librarian. I'm both, it's with okay. So the dope head wrap, that would be even more for me. Like, <laughs> extra. She's doing the extra. most. <laughs> the, the most. I would be like, oh my God, I can do this. So, yes, thank you for being such like an awesome, like, 
you know, responsible. Yes, all the things, girl. I, I mean, I always pick you up, but like, I'm still saying like, you know, I don't think you realize how incredible it is to like your physical presence like yeah. how that actually makes like such like a mark even on other teachers lives so yeah pick yourself up hey you know what it's i mean we're out here <laughs> in mutual admiration society that's really all i can say you know, I, I have a gold dress on today i was trying to be like mutual low-key fangirling you know match the cover of the book um but i just want folks to know that the this is somebody who I adore and I adore her work. And I want you all to just know that when you open up these books, a lot of love and a lot of blood, sweat and tears and all yes. this pain, but also all this joy was put into these works to bring them to you. So yes. yeah, so that's what we've got for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.